Well, uh, close to a year and a half ago, my spouse passed away and in her sleep, it was a sudden death. And uh, of course that put me into uh, just an intense uh, state of grief. And grief is um, probably one of the most, if not the most intense human emotion I think one can experience. And um, you know, it's just, you, you become unhinged. You just don't, just reality doesn't seem to seem real and there's no peace. I've always believed in God and uh, you know, I've been a Christian for many, many years. But sometimes you can get, um, you know, kind of complacent about it. But when there's a crisis in your life or something like this, it can cause you really to lean in even more and to trust the Lord and to um, really rely on Him for the strength. And that's, that's what I did and it, it got me um, through through the grief and the mourning process. And I discovered Grief Share at Shoreline, and I went there um, about a year ago was my first session with that. That experience in Grief Share is what got me, got me through it. And it was very, very helpful, very comforting. I, I leaned into God, you know. I have grown to the point where the Lord has given me um, a chance to, to love again, to live again. And I met a wonderful woman and uh, we got married. So I got remarried and I'm in a, a whole new chapter of life now. In my case, I have grown out of the grief, out of mourning to joy. And that is the slogan of Grief Share, from mourning to joy. thought long and hard about what I would share this morning, uh, and I've decided that I'm, I'm going um, to tell you a secret, something. It's deep, it's important, and I've never shared it from here before, and I don't, uh, but I think now's the time. Those of you that are freaking out, it's not that kind of secret. <laughs> Gee, clean it up. I'm uh, thinking about secrets. I was thinking about secrets before I got ready for this message. And I'm, as I walked through secrets, I started thinking, well, there's all kinds of secrets. There are secrets that really are secrets. There are secrets that are just little known facts. And there are secrets that are more mythology, maybe. We don't know. So some that I came up with are this. For example, if you know what a Bowie knife is, most people grow up knowing what a Bowie knife is. Well, the story is that a man named James Black, back in the um, early uh, 1830s, devised a way to create a metal and a blade that was uniquely difficult or, or, or hard and, and flexible and enduring and kept an edge better than any knife that had ever come uh, forward before. And Jim Bowie designed it, and this guy made the metal. And so what happens is, over history, apparently the secret to how he did this is lost. He, it's said that he made them behind a leather curtain and that no one ever got to saw the process. And to this day, they've never been able to duplicate that. In fact, the metal was likened to what's called Damascus steel. And in the ancient world, there was a steel called Damascus steel that was so much better than everybody else's. If you fought the enemy, you could slice right through their swords. Well, this process by which this man, James Black, uh, made this deal was a secret then, and it died with him, so they say. So, here's another one. In 1680s to 1700, somewhere in there, there was a man born in Cremona, or that lived in Cremona, Italy. His name was Stradivari. And he had this gift for making violins and cellos and violas and guitars. And he created a sound that was unique and was revolutionary. And to this day, out of the 1,100 instruments he made, only 650 remain, but they're so valuable. One auction within the last two years at around $35 million. And it was because of the prized sound that the instrument made. And yet, to this day, it's never been duplicated. With all the science and forensics and skill that people have today, they cannot duplicate the sound of a Stradivarius. I... I uh, 
I checked that with our violinist, Shana, who was uh, in our worship group, and she goes, it's true. She has an excellent violin, but it can't do the sound of a Stradivarius. And he died with the secret. He didn't tell anybody. It's not written down. It may never, ever be duplicated. That's a secret. And then the next one is a secret that's not so much a secret. It's just kind of interesting, and it's very near and dear to my heart. Doritos. <laughs> I learned how, where Doritos came from. In 1955, at Disneyland, the Frito-Lay Company opened a Mexican restaurant on the campus of Disneyland called Casa de House of something, Casa de something. And one of the sales reps for the company was swinging through to check on things, and he looks in the dumpster, and he goes, you're throwing away all these tortillas. And they said, well, we didn't use them all. He goes, don't throw them away. I'll tell you what, fry them up. Put some seasoning on them. Let people have them. And it took off, and it went like crazy. And in the 1960, early something, it officially became called Doritos. Now, that's not a secret so much, but you might win a contest, a trivia contest at your next dinner party. When you say, who knows about Doritos? You're the winner. I want to talk about another secret today. There's a secret that Paul talks about in the book of Philippians. And it's a secret, but it's not a secret. But it's the word Paul uses when he says, I've learned the secret of contentment, whether in prosperity or poverty. I've learned the secret. And it's a secret that is shared with us. It's in God's holy word. It's in the scripture. And Paul learned the secret from where we can learn the secret. Paul learned it from Jesus. As you know, after he was stricken on the road to Damascus, he went up to a place called Arabia, not Saudi Arabia, but Arabia, and, and the Lord spoke to him and taught to him for just under three years or so. He taught him everything. Paul uses the word secret later. Where do we first encounter, when Paul says the secret of contentment or peace, where do we first encounter this? I like the way we read about it in the book of John, in chapter 14, verse 27. 27. And the truth is, peace comes from a who, not from the what of my circumstances. The who is the Jesus we find in John 14, 27. He says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. He's leaving, he says, Peace I leave with you. And we can, hear, we can understand from that. He's going away, but he's leaving something behind. And he says, it's my peace. It's a possessive my. He's not saying there's a peace over here in a box or in a book, and you guys can learn about it too. He's saying, I already have it in here. And I'm going to give it to you. And why would he do that? Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. See, so we learn here there's the peace the world gives and there's the peace that Jesus gives. They're distinct and different. The peace that the world gives takes the form of worry reduction, doing those things that reduce worry. A couple of weeks ago, we're in a third of our peace series, and a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Kevin Gray gave an excellent message on the things that we can do to really reduce worry and to calm ourselves. If you weren't here, go online and you can see it um, on our website. Last week, Pastor Kevin talked about the peace that can come when we're in dispute or in conflict or in disagreement, and yet a, Christ, a Christian can still be at peace in that context. Today, we're talking about a peace that's very different from those. And here's a definition I ran across. I didn't write this, but I love it. The peace Jesus gives is defined as confidence and trust of God's wise and good control of your life. Confidence and trust of God's wise and good control of your life. He's leaving peace with us. He's leaving peace with those he's speaking to. We need to know about this context to fully grasp what this means to us. Where is he when he says these words? He's in the upper room. It's the last supper. Jesus is preparing his followers for his departure, and they don't understand this departure yet doesn't make any sense to them. We love you, so we're respecting you. We're eating together, and you're telling us about this, and you've mentioned that you're leaving and something about three days, but we don't really get it. And he's going to leave, and, and they're thinking, well, we didn't write any of this stuff down that you said. You can't leave. How are we going to retain any of this? They didn't have iPads or phones or, you know, even pencil and paper. They're just going, well, 
You did the miracles. You did everything. You, you confounded everybody with your teaching. You amazed and astounded people with your teaching. The Bible says, and you're leaving? But it's not just that. He knows where he's going. At the end of chapter 14, Jesus says, let's go. You can read it. Let's go. Where are they going? Across the Kidron Valley up to the Garden of Gethsemane. From that garden, you can see Jerusalem easily. It's not that far. And he knows what he's going to. Jesus knows he's going to the, the trial, the persecution, the suffering, the torture, the crucifixion, and the resurrection. He knows that. He's been preparing for it. It's why he came to earth. But here's what else he knows. He looks in the eyes of these faithful men and he knows what's going to happen to them. They don't know. They have no idea. He knows. And you can see him. He's looking at him. He's going, yeah, I, I, yours, your trial's going to be this one and, what, and yours is going to be unique in a different area. It's going to be different. And all of their trials are going to be painful and undeserved and horrifying. And he loves them so much that the last thing he does in that room with them is, oh, before we go, can I give you something? See, I have this piece. It's called my piece. I already have it. I want you to have it here. I'm leaving it with you because you're going on to something you can't even imagine. You're going to need more than just your own wit, your own willpower, your own strength, your own training. You're going to need so much more than that to go through this, and you won't deserve any of the things that happen to you. That's how much he loves him. He, Jesus does not want our hearts to be troubled. He does not want us to be afraid. What's a troubled heart? A troubled heart is about the condition of my heart. I can have a suspicious heart. I can have an a, a, um, angry heart. I can have a resentful heart. I can have a confused heart. That means the ongoing emotional condition I'm in often. It's a state of being. That's the condition of my heart. I can have a troubled heart. And he says, and do not be afraid. Where does fear happen? Fear happens here in our thoughts. Our thoughts can be about a real threat or a perceived threat. A perceived threat is what causes anxiety more than a real threat because it doesn't even happen and yet our mind somehow says it is and we're locked up in fear about something we can't even know if it's going to happen the way we fear it. That's anxiety. Happens here. Jesus is saying, don't let that heart be troubled. Don't have a troubled heart and do not be afraid. Let's get control of this as well. That's going to come into play in a little bit here when we talk about how Paul mentions that also. So what kind of peace does the world give us? The world says that our lack of peace comes from the absence of what we expect to be ours at this point in my life, what I expected to be mine. Expectations is everything. I've got a list I'm going to go through here, but I want you to know you might be able to add some things on this list for yourself. We may not touch on your expectations today. But here's some. For example, security. I expect it to be safe and secure by now in life. I expect to not sense threat. I expect to not have anyone mess with my safety and security. I expect that. I expect good health. I really do. Isn't it interesting how time and time and time again when we're sick or have an injury, we were like surprised. What the heck? What's going on? I got a cold. Hey. We're surprised. We expect good health. How about love in our relationships? So some more so. In other words, those intimate, close relationships, we expect love. I expected it to be here. I expect it to happen. Prosperity. And there's some that even teach prosperity comes to all Christians who do thus and so. We're not teaching that, but I do know that we have an expectation of prosperity. We should thrive. Others are thriving. Why don't I thrive monetarily with material gain? Why am I not prosperous? Or how about this achievement of goals? You know, whether a goal is a weight loss goal in January, whether it's a college degree or a certain amount of money to have a better vacation, whatever it is, we set these goals, and I expect to meet them. Something's wrong if I don't meet these goals. They don't happen for me. We expect a long life. We expect a long life. You look at the average age in America of a man and a woman, and I look at the average age, I confess, it's 78 something. I expect because I exercise and eat better to kind of exceed that. 
And if I was getting bad off around 74, I would tend to think something went wrong. Something's wrong. Have that expectation. We have the expectation of the well-being of those we care about. Friends, family, children, grandchildren. We, we expect them to have a good well-being. I have other expectations and that have been disappointing. I expected that my brother and I, who was my best friend in life, would still be doing vacations at the ocean together, which we did for years. We'd still be diving together, surfing together, spearfishing together. And the Lord took him home in 2007. And it was too early. Why? Because I had an expectation that he would still be here. He's not. That was tough. Last Friday, I was down in Carlsbad spending the day with my mom. I do these trips, a 34-hour trip, I call it. I drive at night, spend the day with mom, sleep two hours, drive back. It's the only way to spend that time. My mother, as I understood her, is gone. My mother has Alzheimer's, so she's not the same. I didn't expect this. I went to Israel with her. We did a lot of great things together. We had great conversations over the years, and I expected we would until the Lord took her home, and that mom is gone, and that was grieving for someone who's gone but not gone. It's that crazy world of losing your memory. And I understood it happened to other people, but I really didn't expect it to happen to me, and yet I live there now. And where do we get these expectations? It's my contention as someone who really likes studying group behavior and cultural shifts and changes. It's my contention that what we've done right now in, in modern America is we've taken wants and desires, turned them into needs, then converted those into rights. It's my right to have these things. It's even beyond an expectation. It's my right. What do we call our rights? I have a right to a good home, my own home. I have a right to a great partner. I have a right to great friends. I have a right to a good job. I do. Other people have them. I have a right to one. I have a right to good health. I have a right to a good income. I have a right to a long life. I have a right to a right to a right to. Part of the reasons I became a professional marriage and family therapist years ago was to help people deal with the disappointed expectations of what wasn't going the way they planned. And, and as a Christian, here's another one. I... I'm a believer. I have a right to peace. I have a right to all these things because I gave my life to Jesus. I attend church. I read the Bible. I tithe. I volunteer. I have a right to all this. stuff. I'm not like those other people. I accepted Jesus. I have an expectation. We do. Things we say to ourselves like, you know, by this time I should have had. Well, I thought my daughter would have had. I have a friend who has a daughter who hasn't found her life mate yet. And they wrestle with it because they feel like, well, by now she should have. Uh, um, I, I, I should be in this position, but I'm not. I should have become this kind of professional, but I haven't. It doesn't feel right. There's something wrong. My expectations are off track. And what's the problem with that viewpoint? The world, as we know it, we look outside and we experience the world, each of us, uniquely and collectively. And then a brief look at history shows that the world has never met all the expectations that people have. It cannot. It doesn't work like that. We live in a broken and troubled world, and here we are sinners in a broken and troubled world. What kind of recipe is that for everything to go well? It's not. The expectations we do have are either unmet or they're met, and we develop new ones. Our world cannot do it. And so why is it that way? Well, the world can only provide temporary solutions to the problem of the moment. See, we confuse relief with peace. When we're, all we're getting with relief isn't peace, we're getting a brief break. It's like when I look at the ocean to see if it's a good day to go out in the boat Saturday. It might be, but it might not be. And if I go out and it's a great day and I take someone with me, with me I have to tell them, no, it's not always like this. I, I, I need you to know. It could be different. It's a break. Here's another question. Here's an important question for a believer. Will Jesus help me gain peace by adjusting the world to my expectations and adjusting other people's behavior to meet my expectations, thereby bringing me peace? And the answer is a resounding no. It's not going to happen like that. What can we expect? 
I've been reading a book called The Everlasting Man by G.K. Chesterton, and it's so thick I can read like a paragraph at a time, then I get a headache, but it's really good. It's really, that's just me. It's really good. And I found in there a definition of what we can expect in our life, and Chesterton is the guy that C.S. Lewis would read a lot as he developed his faith later and his practice and his theology. Chesterton said this. If you got a bulletin, you can fill these in. Jesus promised his disciples three things that they would be completely fearless, absurdly happy, and in constant trouble. He, Jesus says more about this later in John as he's getting ready to do what he's come to do. He says in John 16, 33, I have told you these things. He's been talking to them this time, teaching, so that in me, hear this again, in me, not in yourselves, in me, you will have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So it does Jesus promise. What do we read in scripture that we can expect as a follower of Jesus? And you can add to this list. I got a list you can add. Number one, trouble. We can expect trouble. Number two, we can expect suffering. We can expect it. We can expect conflict in marriage and families and neighborhoods. Friendships, working relationships, we can expect it. We can expect obstacles and ride out roadblocks. We can. And fill in the blank with your own stuff. Because you have some I don't have on my list. We can expect those things. And why is that? Because not only does life not get smoother when you become a Christian, what else happens when you become a Christian? You've acquired an enemy. An en enemy who hates you with a hate we almost can't comprehend and has millions of demons at his disposal. It's true. Jesus talks about it. It's true. And he can't take your salvation. Nothing can snatch you from the hand of God. Your salvation is not open to be taken by the enemy. The word Satan means prosecutor. And his native tongue is lying. So what can he take? He can go after your peace and your joy. He can tell you that you don't have hope. You don't have joy. No, there's nothing you can count on with God. That's when he can go after. You can expect that. Super tough to lay that out this morning. And if I ended here, you'd probably have a bleak kind of a day. <laughs> there's other things we can expect. Here's a list of some things you can expect. What does Jesus also help us know we can expect? Jesus to be with you. I am with you. Jesus is in me and we are in Jesus. Jesus is in you and you are in Jesus when you call him Savior. We can expect the Holy Spirit to comfort you and give you strength. Jesus is also telling his follow followers in 14, he goes, I gotta leave, I gotta leave, but in order... In order to have the Holy Spirit come, I have to go. And, and remember that earlier worry about, well, we didn't write down all the stuff you said. Jesus tells them, he says, well, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to remind you of what I've already taught you. Whew. And he's going to teach you all things. Okay, that's better. The Holy Spirit is going to comfort you and give you strength. What else do we have? Assurance that your eternity is secure. If I'm somewhere in a situation where I'm near death, I hope I never say, oh, God, help me. Isn't that odd? It's kind of paradoxical. I don't want to say that. I just want to say, Lord, I, I'm going home. I don't need you to take this from me as much as the pain is, is bad. Can you take the pain away? But I don't want to, and I hope I never do at the last minute, say, gosh, I hope I'm saved. If you're saved and you've invited Jesus into your heart, your salvation is secure. Your assurance of eternity is done. That's a promise. Here's what else you can expect. Fellowship and support from your church family. Church is not this building. I, 
I think of it that way sometimes, but I'm reminded regularly it's not. Church is the people. The original word used in the Greek was ecclesia. It's about a gathering of people. It was never about a structure. So I'm glad we have a structure. But you're the church. I'm the church. And church is family when you come and decide to be in the family. Because there are folks who, maybe they're tentative, they're not sure yet, so they attend once in a while for years. We're always glad to see them, but they never quite become part of the family. When you do, you can, fellow, you can expect fellowship and support from your family. What else can you expect? See, Jesus left. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all I've commanded you and surely I'll be with you to the end of the age. We're it. So we can also expect love and compassion from your church family. That's what our care ministries are about out in the courtyard. That's what our community service is about. We want to care for everybody, wherever you are, whatever stage of life, whatever your situation, however the Lord leads us, we pray for the means and the resources and the wherewithal to develop ministries to care for you. You can expect that. So again, what kind of peace does Jesus leave with us? He says, the peace of God, it's the peace of God. So that's distinct and separate from me saying, well, my peace is what I get from deep breathing and muscle relaxation, which is good stuff. It really is. I can say, my peace comes from that. This peace of God is so different from that. It's so different. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. I still can't get my head around it. If you can, teach me. I don't really understand it. How could that peace get every one of those disciples and so many that followed through the horrifying things of their life and they don't give up Jesus? I don't know how that works. This is Paul speaking. He continues to speak in Philippians. He says, this peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Wait a minute. John 14, 27, let not your heart be troubled and do not be afraid. Paul gets what Jesus said. Even though it was written later, Paul spent time with Jesus. Paul saying, my heart and my mind is guarded with the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. And Paul's, we know about him. He's in prison. Not rightfully so. False charges. Unjustly treated. He's saying, but I've learned the secret. He has this peace. So how does Paul encourage us to do it? He says, rejoice in the Lord always. And then he repeats it. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. This Philippians 4, 4 through 6. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Why does he say... With thanksgiving, what's that about? Well, as I consulted teaching on this, I found it handled two different ways by teachers I respect. One teacher said, well, that's, that's really acknowledging that if you knew everything God did, whatever you got from your prayer would be the right answer. You'd know that. It's what you would have prayed for if you knew everything God does. Maybe so. Another teacher said, with thanksgiving means you're thanking him again for everything he's already done for you to get you to this point and still have a life. He's saying, so give thanks for the journey you've traveled up to this point. Either way, Paul says, with thanksgiving as an act of trust and faith. Give your request to God. See, we embrace that the giver of peace, Jesus, is near. He says again in Matthew, behold, I am with you always, Matthew 28. We have to get that. Again, this, this piece, this piece is about a relationship with the giver of peace. It isn't about my techniques that help me feel less worry and anxiety, which are great things. This is about a relationship with the giver and what comes with that. How do we do it? How do I do that? What, what, what would I do today as a, if I went out and said, I want that peace, that gift? I contend that peace comes from immersion leading to saturation. When I went to Northern Arizona University, 
many moons ago. They had a Spanish immersion program. It was the second year, and you had to get interviewed to get in, and I got in. Again, it was a university, a Northern Arizona University, which also stands for not actually a university. That's what we used to say. <laughs> I mean, it was so easy to get in that I couldn't think that well of them because they let me in, and it's like, how good could they be? But I went to this program, and I learned from day one, English wasn't allowed. It was nine hours a day for four months. Those who've had training in a foreign language know that you've got to do it that way. Think of it this way. When the rain falls on thirsty soil, and it's been dry for a long, long time, rain just goes in and in and in and in and in until it reaches a saturation point. And then subsequent rainfall runs off of it. What if that was us in our relationship with Christ, day in and day out, in him, rejoice, giving thanks in all circumstances. And I just, I'm immersed and I get saturated. Then the, then the tricks of Satan and his demons that come against me and, and the attempts by things in the world that pull me away run off. That's my part, being immersed in him. It's immersed in what I think and immersed in who I'm thinking about. Paul tells us more about this in Philippians 4 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. My mind is something that could be directed to think about things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. And then he says, and the God of peace will be with you. Paul says, put into practice. A practice is two things. A practice is an ongoing set of you know, uh, work experiences and behavior, and it's also something we do every day. It's both here. I want the practice of, and I want to practice it, both what Paul says about who I think about and what I think about. Paul goes on to say, I have the secret of contentment. There's the secret. But anybody can have this. Paul never says, I uniquely get a secret that the rest of you aren't good enough, smart enough, or accomplished enough to have. He says just the opposite. I'm in prison. I'm going to be killed for following Jesus, and there's nothing special about me, and I don't own anything, and I have a peace that anybody can have because it's a gift from him. So the good news is that Jesus gives anyone who turns their face towards him and says, Jesus, come in and save me. He gives them a deep, enduring peace that isn't an escape from troubles in the world. It's peace in the midst of, because they're always going to be here. In this world, you will have trouble, but I have overcome the world. And here's the beauty. It's a peace the world just can't give. But because it's a peace the world can't give, the world cannot take it away. Amen. Hallelujah. This is a gift, everyone. It's a gift. It's for you. You don't work at it. You just run the sunbeam up to the sun, to the person, the giver of light and life and love and hope, and be immersed in your fellowship and your relationship with Jesus because he's near. And he's with us always. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time. And thank you for this encouragement and this truth. That you are near. You are real. Thank you, Jesus, that you love those disciples enough. And you love us enough. Everyone in this room who knows you as Savior. Everybody in the world who has or does or will know you as Savior. Has this gift. And we find it in you. Not outside of you not in our own work, not in a, a series of actions or activities. This peace, it's a peace we find only in you. And you give it freely. That's what we want. That's what we need. We thank you for it, Father. Bless each one here that you know exactly what they need. Minister to them, together and individually, right where they need to be ministered to. What is it that they need peace in the midst of? Father, would you supply that? Would you just bring that down through your Holy Spirit? And we thank you for this, and we trust you for it. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen.